Thank you, Bridget. I, I panicked when Joe mentioned the swim uh, tomorrow morning because I remember that I forgot my armbands. Um, <laughs> Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm extremely grateful to Joe Mulholland for the invitation to speak at this year's McGill Summer School. And I congratulate him and his team on maintaining a very central role for the school in the agenda setting of public discourse in Ireland uh, over many years. I'm from the generation of Irish people that was educated literally under a framed copy of the 1916 proclamation placed so high on the classroom wall as to make it unreadable. It usually had equal billing with various forms of religious iconography that included perpetual lights that seemed to be powered by a force that predated rural electrification. If we had wallpaper in our school, it would have been called Saints, Scholars and Subversives in a Titian Glow. The curriculum was strong on Irish, English and maths and very strong on religion. To illustrate how strong it was on religion, let me use this occasion to admit smugly but not bitterly that I still cannot do long division because I was serving mass when we did it. <laughs> English, maths and religion were the four certainties. Every other educational bonus was fortuitous. The one thing that we never discussed in class was the state or our relationship to the state as citizens. There were what I would call tangential moments of patriotic transfer, when we learn things like the words of the foggy Jew are a nation once again, but they felt more like occupational therapy for the teacher and his guitar. So we sang of our willingness to die for a state that we lived in and loved, but barely understood. More importantly, we sang raucously of our willingness to fight against the state that we lived beside and ironically in which we might eventually live. And the curriculum under which I and my age cohort were educated quite simply ignored and I presume consciously avoided the idea of political formation or constitutional literacy through education. Our consciousness of the political process might never have occurred were it not for periodic temporary evictions, which we call days off, from the school to facilitate polling stations in elections. The only other days off, by the way, were those sanctioned by the bishop on rare visits to the school and those resulting from naturally occurring disasters like snow, outbreaks of contagious diseases, infestations of head lice and lightning, even if the lightning didn't affect the perpetual light. So in the absence of a developed capacity for critical engagement with political thinking, it should hardly therefore come as a surprise that the ideologically indistinguishable Fianna Fáil Fine Gael dominance of Irish politics endured for so long and that tribal political affiliations passed through generations for as long as they did. That is not to say that teachers did not pass on their civil war and other non-correlative biases in delivering the curricular goods, they most certainly did. The point I'm trying to emphasize, however, is that the curriculum didn't go there when it came to what in other countries would have been taken for granted as civic formation or what I call constitutional literacy through education. In lamenting this, I'm not arguing for the kind of brainwashing that occurs elsewhere involving collective recitation of oaths or fidelity and saluting flags and that kind of thing. What I regret is that at a critical stage in the evolution of the state, we failed to use our education system to address the question of constitutional illiteracy when it might have de developed the capacity of citizens to engage critically with their state. We opted for different versions of unthinking nationalism when we might at least have opted for thinking nationalisms. And even if this has since been addressed in some curricular reform, however imperfectly and arguably at the expense of good education and history, the earlier neglect has an enduring adverse implication for particularly for people of my own generation. Our political spectrum is crowded in the middle with left-wing Christian Democrats, right-wing Social Democrats, all competing for ownership of a confused and at times incoherent centrism. The party of government has almost always been Fianna Fáil, with Fine Gael acting as its ideologically indistinguishable understudy. Of course, smaller parties have played a disproportionately important role, but the consistent pattern in Irish elections, albeit with diminishing numbers, has been that Irish people largely favour centrist parties.
The pattern is confirmed if Labour is viewed as a centrist party, a debate perhaps for another occasion. And yet we remain happy to acquiesce in the mythology of the Irish as a politically sophisticated race. This, I believe, is nonsense. We may be politically cunning, but we are demonstrably incapable of big political thinking or visionary politics. We are operators rather than thinkers, pragmatists who adapt and sometimes subvert political systems rather than design them. The amoral localism so well described by the late Peter Mayer at last year's McGill Summer School defines Irish politics in a way that simply cannot be excused or explained away as a feature of politics in any small country. This may also explain partially what my colleague Dan O'Brien has decried as inertia in some of his writing. Now the story of the 1937 constitution and its emergence from the messy dispensation that existed from 1922 illustrates this point, although I think it would be churlish not to acknowledge that the drafting of the Constitution was a borderline visionary moment. De Valera seized the opportunity of the abdication crisis. And the abdication crisis was one of those that arose from periodic British constitutional crises that erupt when the love lives of significant royals become more complicated than their unwritten constitution can bear. This was the one that arose between Edward and Wallace Simpson. And he used this to hasten the, the creation of a context requiring a new Irish constitution that was in many respects similar to its predecessor. There was minimal innovation with the cabinet or executive, including the, the civil service, remaining at the center of power, answerable in theory to a dull and a restored but weakened Shannon. The list of recognized fundamental rights was extended and natural or higher law language uh, was used in various parts of the text of the constitution. The practical consequences of including such language, which became very clear in controversial cases in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, may in fact have been unintended. De Valera's fond hopes of territorial reintegration and Irish language revival were also, of course, inserted as suspended realities, assertions about a, an imagined future written in the present tense, on Tauhi Salawatha Nuan. God was given more than one decent mention, and critically, popular sovereignty was made more meaningful than it had been under the previous dispensation by providing that the text of the Constitution could only be amended by popular amendment, popular referendum, excuse me, with simple majority voting. It would seem, according to Mr. Justice Jared Hogan's magisterial study of the history of the 1937 mm -hmm. Constitution, that de Valera did intend that the explicit power of judicial review of legislation would be used, and despite concerns expressed by civil servants at the time, that he even considered establishing a constitutional court to give greater effect to this intention. A bare majority of the people voting in 1936 approved de Valera's constitution, and most women voting did not. 75 years later, it remains the constitution of this state. It is as enigmatic as Ulysses. Everyone knows about its existence, but few people know anything about it. The Constitution has been subjected to various forms of review that usually coincide with significant anniversaries. So when it reached its 30th birthday, it was analyzed by an all-party Oireachtas committee. When it reached its 60th birthday, it was analyzed, I think, very well and forensically by the Constitution Review Group, chaired by T.K. Whitaker. Uh, and that report spawned numerous and some excellent uh, Oireachtas committee reports on the Constitution. On its 70th birthday, we just had a few academic conferences, and now on the occasion of its 75th anniversary, the Constitution is going to be subjected to the scrutiny of a constitutional convention made up of politicians and citizens. The convention starts with a formidable challenge because it has to deal with the following items uh, of potential constitutional reform within a very tight frame and with a very tight resources. So reducing the term of the presidency to five years, reducing the voting age to 17, same-sex marriage, reviewing the Doyle electoral system, obviously not the Shannon, because we're going to abolish that, blasphemy, and the position of women in the home. There will also be fringe events that rather dwarf the birthday celebrations represented by the establishment of the, commission, of the convention, including a referendum to insert an explicit reference to children's rights in Article 42 of the Constitution, as well as a referendum or multiple referenda to abolish Shannon Aaron. Uh, 
Michael McDowell, Senior Counsel, spoke convincingly here last night about the folly of the latter proposal and to his credit proposed an alternative model of legislative reform of the Shannon. I will now say something that I have never said before in my life. I agree fully with Michael McDowell. <laughs> I feel okay now after that. As if that wasn't enough, last week the Minister for Justice, Equality and Defence, Alan Shatter, floated the possibility of further constitutional referenda on the establishment of a court of civil appeal, an enabling provision to allow for the establishment inter alia of family courts, various changes to the procedure whereby the President may refer legislation to the Supreme Court to test its constitutionality, including controversially provision to allow the Supreme Court to refuse to accept such references and provision to allow for the, the government to refer international agreements to the Supreme Court prior to ratification to ascertain by way of an advisory opinion their compatibility with the Constitution. Now bearing in mind that three referenda have already been held in the term of this government since it came to power in 2011, we can presumably expect every record of attempted constitutional amendment to be broken by this administration before it leaves office in 2016. The late Gareth Fitzgerald would not even have dreamed of such a constitutional crusade. And much of the commentary about the proposed constitutional convention has been negative or skeptical and has focused both on process and substance. For some people who are keen on the idea of citizens' assemblies and deliberative democracy as a supplement to representative democracy, the inclusion of politicians in the membership of the convention is a distortion. For others, the proposed agenda of the convention is disappointingly narrow and shallow, and the time allowed for it to deliberate is inadequate. There are, of course, people who are just dismissive of the whole project, people who view most deliberative processes as wasteful or pointless indulgences. And while what has emerged by way of concrete proposal is a compromise between both parties in government, following some consultation with the opposition parties, it falls short of the rhetorical promise held forth by Fine Gael and Labour prior to their coming into, the, into office. This is a serious matter for those who believe in political renewal by means of constitutional reform. My own view for what it's worth is that a serious effort at a citizens' assembly could be worthwhile. I think it could be especially worthwhile in considering models of radical reform of local government and perhaps even connecting such reforms to a reconstituted Shannon. Whether or not the Citizens' Assembly model is suited to the subject of holistic constitutional reform is questionable. The Constitution cannot be avoided as an instrument of political reform or state rebuilding, but it can be a rather technical part of that process. If the view has been taken that a citizens' assembly can handle constitutional reform in the broad sense, it seems odd that it has not been asked to consider big constitutional questions like executive accountability and parliamentary power, as well as fundamental questions concerning what we call rather quaintly distributive justice, but what everyone else calls socioeconomic rights. And perhaps the omission of these big topics is because the citizens' views might actually be noticeably out of step with establishment views in these areas. I think the citizenry might have some very interesting things to say about executive accountability or whether or not they wished to have explicit uh, socioeconomic rights in the Constitution that I think would almost certainly differ with the view of the establishment. If I may suggest in the interest of being constructive a government-centered reasoning for opening up the agenda of the Convention as currently proposed, and it would be to allow the politicians to engage with the citizenry on the complexity of delivery in these areas. Politicians could say to citizens, not in a way that is dismissive, but in a way that is listening, that it is in fact difficult to establish real executive accountability, or that there might be a difficult with difficulty with real or meaningful socioeconomic rights. The exclusion of experts and civil society groups from membership of the Convention, but not from its processes, has also contributed to some of the disappointment attending the announcement of the Convention. I think a practical way or a pragmatic way of dealing with this, and again I'm trying to be constructive, would be for the Secretariat of the new Convention to synthesize the many excellent reports done to date on constitutional reform so that the citizens who participate in that assembly have an accessible and, in a sense, familiar knowledge base on which to proceed and are not going back reinventing the wheel all over again.
However, unless the Convention can broaden its agenda so as to subject the 1937 to a more radical appraisal, even if the ultimate result therefrom might be conservative, it will amount to little more than a gimmick that genuflects mockingly at the idea of citizen engagement, deliberative democracy, and renewal through radical reform. The damage to public trust that would result from such an exercise is very real. If I have two minutes, perhaps three? One, One? okay. I'll collapse that into two, perhaps. But um, in considering what constitutional conventions are for, we must not avoid the more fundamental qu question, what are constitutions for? I'm going to skip through a bit here, but essentially we need to use language that I don't like using, the language of management science. It's more like a mission statement than an operational plan. Constitutions aren't as important to most people as they are to those of us who are constitutional lawyers or who are political scientists or are experts of one sort or another. We have a complex constitutional tradition in Ireland that has almost always been trans-jurisdictional, uh, involving the national question, but also involving European constitutional developments. Because we have frequent referenda, we may have an overstated sense of our popular sovereignty. We may not be as powerful as we think we are as people because we take part in these referenda from time to time. The one critical thing is that any proposal for constitutional reform, bar one or two, have always come from the government. And that is the filter. The government decides what you ultimately decide by way of constitutional reform. We don't have a popular initiative type uh, power, and I'm certainly not suggesting that we should have one. I think that is the critical question. Are the conditions ripe for a major constitutional review? Everybody thought they were prior to the election in 2011. Now there seems to be less urgency about that. I have a suspicion that the people are still where they were in 2011 and would like a more radical appraisal of the Constitution as a way of renewing politics in this country. I think if we cannot open up the agenda of the Constitutional Convention, we will forego that very important opportunity in a way that is very truly damaging to public trust at a time when that should not be messed around with. Thank you very much. Thank you.